Um, welcome to the, I believe this is the second colloquium of the semester at the Department of Library and Information Science here at Catholic University. Um, I'm Bill Coolis, I'm the chair of the department. I just wanted to say thank you for coming out today. And um, it's, uh, you know, we do these colloquia um, several times a semester and it's always a pleasure to have, have people come in who can share, you know, experiences that we, that we don't have and get more information about um, where different parts of the field are going, where different parts of industry are going, where academia is going. So um, I'll turn the, turn the floor over to Suyan to introduce our guest speaker and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So this is our um, second podcast <laughs> of this, uh, uh, for this semester. We have Dr. Sharon Leon here. Um, she is uh, the director of director of public project at the Louis Wilson Woods Center for the History and New Media and associate professor of history at George Mason University. Um, she also has um, her books um, published on um, the, the book title is An Image of God and the Catholic Struggle with so which have a close relationship with um, the Catholic uh, history and um, some digital relation related um, um, projects. She oversees some collaborations with partners from around the country, uh, direct exhibits and archiving projects as well as research and tool development for public history including Mecca and crypto. So I'm hoping that she will introduce some of her projects today. Um, um, before I turn the mic to her, <laughs> I just want to um, let everyone know that our third um, uh presentation is scheduled on November 12th. Um, we'll have Donna Shitter, the president elect of Ebola. So um, please mark your calendars for that. Um, I'll welcome Very good. Uh, thank you. Leon, um, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, now, um, this is a pleasant surprise for me. I don't often get to uh, talk to folks at library schools um, or doing information science kinds of things outside of the context of um, professional conferences. I mean, I make a lot of appearances at uh, at SAA and, and those kinds of things, but I don't often get to, to talk to people who are in the process of um, thinking about and shaping the field. And so um, what I want to talk about today, the title of my talk today is Beyond Browse, Mobilizing Digital Collections and Engaging Users. Um, and so before we begin with that, it's really important for you to know what I am not. I am not a librarian. I am not an archivist. And I'm not a curator. You know, like, how the heck do you end up doing a job where you make a software that is designed for these people? Um, well, part of the reason that I have the luxury of working on software projects that touch the work of libraries, museums, and archivists is because I work at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media. Um, and as you can, see, you can see, we're in the midst of celebrating our 20th year. And so what that means is that we are, we have been in the business of thinking about how to do history on the web since the beginning. Um, and so I remember, distinctly remember my adventures as an undergraduate playing with the um, Civil War photographs that were released as the first, the first segment of released material uh, from the Library of Congress in the American Memory Project. And that was, that was 2000, um, no, that was 1995. And uh, the year before, Roy had started the center by putting a sign on his door in the history department uh, at George Mason, suggesting that he was starting this center for history and new media. Um, and if we had it to do again, 
we wouldn't call it the Center for History and New Media. We'd call it the Center for Digital History because nobody knows what the heck new media is. Um, and so digital history has sort of been, uh, has taken over as the term for what we do. Um, but at the point at which Roy started the center, his interest was primarily in providing students and teachers with access to primary sources to do their research, to engage in authentic historical investigations using primary sources. Um, and so the early work of the center, which you can see from the screenshot from the site, and you can see all the way on the left, the division of teaching and learning, there's a reason that's first, and that's because that was our, that was our initial foray into doing uh, digital work, was primarily in the realm of thinking about how students, the kinds of materials students needed to have a better experience of learning about history. Uh, that was followed then eventually by the beginning of some tool development, and some of you will recognize the Zotero stickers that I have at the front. Um, there were lots of tools before Zotero. Zotero is just the, the, the most widely adopted of the tools that came out of that work. Uh, but the guiding principle there, again, was what do scholars need to better do their research in the world of the web? Um, and then we found that in the course of working with students and teachers, we were also working very closely uh, with public historians in the varieties of places in which public historians do their work, which means libraries, museums, archives, historical societies. Um, and so we ended up with these three divisions, which makes it seem like we have this very um, siloed setup where I work on public projects, and Sean Tackett works on research, and Kelly Schramm works on, on education. Um, and in fact, that's not true. We all actually work on all of these things most of the time. Um, but to frame the conversation that I want to have today, I think it's worthwhile to think about what the mission statement of the center has been across those 20 years. Um, and it's on the about page for the site, which you can go look at. But I want to read it to you. It says, since 1994, under the founding direction of Roy Rosenzweig, the center has used digital media and computer technology to democratize history, to incorporate multiple voices, reach diverse audiences, and encourage popular, popular participation in presenting and preserving the past. And so for a group of folks who are technically academic historians, an awful lot of that statement is focused on the user, on the end user and what people really need out of those materials. And that makes a lot of sense to practicing public historians. And it makes a lot of sense to museum professionals. It seems to me that it makes the most sense to people who work in libraries in information sciences. Because unlike our friends who are museum curators who are some days not interested in access, overly interested in preservation, um, everybody I know who works in libraries thinks primarily about use. And so, you're not the only folks who are thinking about use. I'm sure that you're all familiar that with the most recent uh, Knight Foundation News Challenge, which was focused on, quote unquote, how we might leverage libraries as platforms to build more knowledgeable communities. So this idea that people from around the world can just brainstorm project ideas about how we can make libraries a more central uh, figure in knowledge building and community building. Um, I'm looking, really looking forward to seeing uh, what comes out of that competition and what kinds of new and interesting tools and applications get built there. Um, because everything that the Knight Foundation has done so far for journalism has managed to produce lightweight, easy to use tools um, that serve a variety of realms. And then just last week or the week before, I was surprised to see that the folks at the Aspen Institute all of a sudden 
are interested in what public libraries are doing and um, how we can think about rethinking how public libraries serve their communities. And so this notion that there is some larger civic energy about the ways in which library professionals function as a source of energy and knowledge creation for the community, I think is a perfect thing to think about in conjunction with the fact that it's Open Access Week. Happy Open Access Week, everyone. Are you having Open Access Week celebrations and events here? This is it. This is it. OK. <laughs> all right. That's good, because all right, so one thing to say about Open Access Week in relationship to Open Access is that the center doesn't do anything that isn't open source and that isn't released for free. Um, and you might say, but wait, I pay for my Zotero storage. Yes, you pay for your storage. <laughs> you pay for your storage, but you can take that software and do whatever the heck you want with it. The code is out there for free. And part of the reason that we don't do anything that is not open access is that it's built into the philosophy of the center, is that you can't democratize history while you're busy locking it down. Um, and so the content we create and the software we create and all the materials we create are free for you to use. But the real question is, in the line of thinking about open access is we've spent the last 20, 25 years digitizing collections and now it's time for us to think quite concretely about putting them to work. Because we're putting an awful lot of material out there in the world. And the question is, is anyone doing anything with it? Um, and how do, we, how do we do more new and interesting things with those collections? So if we could start in 1995 with the Brady Civil War collection and come to today and look at the massive amount of materials that are, that are available in an open access way for us to do stuff with, we might, have, um, we might have a unique opportunity to start to build that knowledge and, and anchor communities around those collections. And so it seems to me that in the effort to put collections to work, there are three really important questions that all of us have to ask. And that is, where are your users? I'm going to assume that you've already asked the who question. Who are your users? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Who is usually good to start with? Um, but then where are they? What do they want to do? Uh, who do you want to play with? Who do you want to collaborate with? None of us can do this on our own. Uh, we, especially at the Center for History and New Media, can't do it on our own because we don't have any collections. We don't have any stuff. So if, if we don't collaborate with the rest of you, who are those holders of collections, we can't get anything done. Um, and then finally, What's the new area you want to build in? What's the next experiment you want to run? So my suggestion about where are your users um, is in line with this notion that we have to meet our users where they are. Um, in some cases, they're in your university library studying for their midterms. Um, in most cases, they're not. They're out in the world. They're absolutely out in the world. And they have... Um, different needs and goals and desires than at least most scholarly users do. Um, and so thinking about meeting users where they are uh, in the field seems to me one of the most important questions. And we can see this in a lot of places, but the one that stands out most to me lately is that the Institute for Museum and Library Services did a strategic plan for their goals for what kind of funding they wanted to put out in the world in a variety of special projects. And that plan is supposed to, to cover the years between, between 2012 and 2016. And the title of the plan is Creating a Nation of Learners. And there are, there are five strategic points in that plan. And three of them are about users. So 
IMLS places the learner at the center and supports engaging experiences in libraries and museums that prepare people to be full participants in their local communities and our global society. Two, IMLS promotes museums and libraries as strong community anchors that enhance civic engagement, cultural opportunities, and economic vitality. And then three, IMLS supports exemplary stewardship of, museums and library, of museum and library collections and promotes the use of technologies to facilitate discovery of knowledge and cultural heritage. So if we start to see all of these things coming together in the last five or six years um, around building not what we think we need, but what we think our users need and what our users are actually asking for. So figuring out what those users actually need is not always the easiest thing in the world. And so I want to take a look at one of the projects that we've been, I've been working on for a while now. Um, we, I know I just said we don't have any collections. Um, we sort of have one collection. <laughs> we have the U.S. Papers of the War Department um, in the period from 1784 to 1800. And the reason we have the U.S. Papers of the War Department is because the War Department burned to the ground in 1800. And so all of those documents were lost. Um, and a group of documentary editors uh, headed by Ted Crackle, who went on to be the editor-in-chief of the George Washington Papers, went out to over 3,500 archives and collections around the country and reassembled that group of documents. There are four, just over 42,000 documents in that collection. And we have them in digital form. Um, we have scans of the documents that they gathered from all those other places. And you'll notice they started in the late 90s, and so we don't have color scans. <laughs> We have high resolution black and white scans, as you can see from this document here. Um, but there are 42,000 documents. It took us six years to do the basic metadata on them so that, so that they would be findable. Um, and then we knew for sure that we were never going to get funding to get them transcribed in the way that one would want to transcribe them for a scholarly edition. And so we decided that we needed to run an experiment. And that experiment was whether or not we could um, get members of the community to volunteer to transcribe those documents. And so we have been running the transcription project on the papers of the War Department for a little over three and a half years now. Um, and as of the end of September, we had just about 2,000 transcribers. Um, it's going up and down or so. Um, and the notion is that we're at about 13,000 saves. That means digital, different edits um, to different documents. And these documents can range from a single letter to a giant letter book that's 350 pages and those sorts of things. Um, the thing that is most interesting about, and the site uses a tool called Scripta, which we've generalized so that other people can do their own transcription projects. Um, uh, but the thing that is most interesting about the transcription project is what people say about why they want to transcribe. So this is sort of my coding of the responses in the, in the sign-up sheets. Um, we ask people to sign up for an account because Scripto uses MediaWiki technology. And those of you who have dealt with MediaWiki know that if you leave it open without a login, you'll just be attacked by spammers. So we ask people to sign up for an account. And what we ask them for to sign up is a username and an email address. And all of the other fields are, all of the other fields are voluntary. But one of them is, why do you want to do this? And we get a shocking 75% response rate on the why do you want to do this. Um, and so, you know, obviously, they're historical documents. Some folks are going to assign them to students as part of, as part of history courses. Um, there are certainly people doing specific research on the topics that are here. Um, and in lots, in most cases, uh, the way I coded that was to suggest that this is somebody doing a research project that is not related to their family history. 
So it's not sort of a genealogy project, but is, is working on a, a specific research project um, of a particular type. Most often, they're grad students. Sometimes they're advanced undergraduates. Sometimes they're just um, researchers out in the public. Um, and there's a special group in here that we're going to talk about in a minute. Scripto, obviously, there are people who are interested in the tool and how it works. And so signing up for a PWD account to do some transcription is a good way to see how the tool works. Um, a really nice number of people who think, this is just part of my civic duty. I'm a member of the community, and it's important to help build these cultural resources. Um, and the folks who are the civic duty, duty folks are often the most prolific transcribers, um, which is kind of nice. Some folks just have a general interest in early national life. And their, their production is almost similar to the, um, to the civic duty folks. And then they're all the genealogists. So when we set this up, we expected, we absolutely positively expected the people to be doing f family research. Because these are military records. They involve you know, um, materials about individual soldiers and pensions and widows and all sorts of things. Um, the thing that we didn't expect, well, the question is, can you see that? Can you see the individual words? Um, these, this is a word sort of the transcriber interests, and I took like the first however many, 50, 25 highest, um, and, it, and it runs backwards. So history, that's a no-brainer. Interested, that's a no-brainer. I'm interested because war, documents, research, American family, most of them, here we get a little bit further up, Indian. A little bit further up, Native. Never occurred to us that tribal folks would be doing uh, research about their communities and their relationship to the early federal government. There's a huge number of tribal historians who are working in the papers of the War Department. Um, and so they were working with the materials already to some degree. Until we did the, you know, we did some significant publicity to make people aware that that we needed their help. Uh, but we never, there's not a chance we would have predicted that use and that audience. And so, to some degree, my suggestion that we need to know where our users are only comes from experience. It only comes from asking them what they want and and what they want to do with it, and then trying in an iterative way to honor that material. But sometimes we know exactly where our users are. And we know that we have something that we can do for them and have to do for them. Um, the center has, over the course of the last 20 years, done a lot of what we call collecting projects. The biggest uh, and probably the most famous is the September 11th Digital Archive, uh, which we just thankfully uh, upgraded to the newest version of Omeka and got to relaunch um, this past September. I mean, it was always available. It's just now you can actually find things in it. Um, so we launched that collecting project um, about six months after September 11th because it was fairly clear that this was the first really major national event where the evidence of it was going to be born digital. There were going to be camera film pictures. There were going to be animations. There were going to be... Um, voicemail and email and all of those sorts of things. And so we opened up a collecting portal to collect that material. And what we ended up with was 150,000 files of people um, either reflecting on the events of September 11th or contributing the evidence of, of that material from their day. And there was, you know, there were lots of partners involved in that project um, and a lot of on the ground work. And it led to several other collecting projects. We have a hurricane um, archive, Hurricane Digital Memory Bank, that collected the stories of people fleeing Katrina and Rita in 2005. Um, and so that stuff's geolocated because we're watching them move through the world. Um, but what we figured out along the way is that these things happen, and you're not necessarily prepared for them, and you need to be on the ground gathering the stuff because if you don't get it, it's gone. And so one of the impetus 
for creating Omeka, which we'll get to, we're getting to, uh, was that we can do these things quickly. And so with an Omeka installation, it is possible to set up a collecting site. And so when the protests started happening around Ferguson and around the Michael Brown shooting, somebody said, lots of people said, we need to save these experiences. We need to save this stuff. Who is working on this? And the obvious answer at that point was that somebody put their hands up at Wash U and said, we'll do an install. And there it is. There are not a ton of things in it yet. There are only 308 things in it, and I'm sure that, you know, because it's a bespoke project, that there's not a lot of, of publicity around it to gather those materials. But once that stuff starts to take off, they're going to have more submissions than they know what to do with. Um, a site like this, it's possible to have it built and in the world and collecting things. Well, with Omeka.net, you can do it in 15 minutes. Um, and so, we may not want to save everything, but we at least have to have the stuff to appraise. And the only way to have the stuff to appraise is to collect it. So, Omeka, how does it work? Omeka is um, it's a free and open source web publishing platform for collections. The way I like to talk about Omeka is that um, it's like WordPress for collections. It has a basic software engine. Um, that runs on open source software. It runs on a LAMP server. And you can change the look and feel with themes and you can extend it with plugins. Um, if you think about WordPress, the logic of WordPress, the post is the controlling logic, the calendar is the controlling logic of a blog. For Omeka, the item is the controlling logic. And so if you take a look at the this is the administrative interface, the back end of an Omeka installation. And this is, in fact, an Omeka.net uh, installation. Omeka.net is the hosted service we run. So if you don't have access to a LAMP server to install your own version of the software, you can just go sign up for an account. Um, and you can, get a free, you can get a free account with a little bit of storage and not very many plugins to try it out. And then depending on how much how big your site gets and what you need, then we'll start to charge you for the space because it's space. Um, and so we just last week finished upgrading Omeka.net to the most version, recent version of Omeka, which is kind of a nice thing. Um, but like WordPress, Omeka kind of has a five minute install. And depending on um, your facility with technology, you can do that yourself or have someone else do it. Um, but then with the contribution plugin, you can start to ask your collecting questions and open up your portal for, for folks to contribute uh, the materials that you're interested in collecting. And the first time that we knew that this was really a good idea and um, was going to be something that we were going to have to do over and over and over again was with the Virginia Tech shootings. Um, they called us from the library and the history department at Virginia Tech and said, can you set us up a collecting site? And that was the very first version of Omeka in 2008. And we had that site up and running for them in two days. Now you can have it. You can have that kind of collecting uh, site up and running. And as I said, 15 minutes. I can teach you how to do it live. Um, so the notion is that you have to find a way to get to your, to get to your users. And sometimes the thing that they want to do is share what they know about the world with you. Um, whether that means contributing through, through this sort of civic duty notion of, I'm going to transcribe this because it's part of our cultural heritage, or it's, I'm going to contribute my perspective on what is happening here in our cultural space. Uh, you have to, um, we have to be agile enough to be able to do both of those things. Now, there are some other kind of reasonable things that we need to think about, and that is that not only what do your users want to do, what do they want to share with you, along the lines of where are they, <laughs> they're on their phones. Um, this data continues to shock me because the folks at the Pew Research Center update it on a regular basis. Nine, so this is, this is, these are the stats for, from January 2014. 90% of adults have a cell phone, American adults. 58 have a smartphone. 32% have an e-reader. I don't know what that says. Does that mean that they're reading their electronic books on, the, on their phones? I, I don't, I like paper. Um, 
and 42% have tablet computers, right? All right, so we all know that everybody's using mobile. And, but the thing that is even more shocking, and this is from, from a year ago, is 34% mostly use their phone for their online access. It's just in the United States. People keep telling us that people around the world use their phones for their internet access, but that's just in the United States. Which means that if we're not designing for mobile, we're not getting to our users where they are. So I hate apps. I hate iPhone apps. I hate iPad apps. I hate Android apps. I hate apps. And the reason I hate apps is what that means is whatever you're giving the world in your app, you have to package it up and put it in the store. And if you want to update it or need to update it, you have to repackage and re-upload. It also means that all of your content has to come down onto that device, and it's going to be huge if you're doing anything significant. So we don't do apps. We do mobile-first responsive design. That's it. And I say that as we're getting ready to package four apps. <laughs> the reason we're packaging four apps is that we have been working for the last three years on this site. Um, this is a mobile-first site called the Histories of the National Mall. It is designed for people who would like to know something about the history of the mall but can never find anyone to tell them. There is never a park ranger anywhere near where you are when you're on the mall, and they don't know this stuff anyway. Um, so this site, as much as people would like it as an app, is simply a mobile first Omeka installation. And it looks dramatically different than that documenting Ferguson site, right? It's because Omeka can look like anything you want it to look like. Uh, but the idea here is that you just type the URL into the browser on your phone. And you get geolocated and you get to wander around. And so the site has, as you can see, maps, explorations, people, and past events. In the maps, you get to select what era you want to explore. And this is the map from, from just before the Civil War. So you select an era, you get a historical map, and you get a bunch of stuff located on it. And if you wander around enough, you'll notice that uh, right there at the corner of 7th, right outside the Capitol, before the Civil War, there was a slave auction pen, right in the sight line of the Capitol. Um, no park ranger is going to tell you that, because they're too busy giving you the, the uh, standard spiel on the Lincoln. right? Um, and also, it's just too much material for anybody to deliver in a person-to-person -person way. So it uses the, the site uses the technologies in your phone to tell you what's around you and to position you on the map um, as well. But not everybody likes to position and explore the world geographically. Um, so we also built a set of explorations. And these are inquiry-driven questions, um, exhibits, that allow users to explore sort of a, a five source answer to each of these questions. Um, and so it lets folks get a little bit deeper into the content. And each of them is answered by a series of primary sources in which we get the actual item and a description and some, some various other things. We have been working on the site for three for three years and it'll be done it'll be done in April. It's been out in, in the world for a year now. Um, and as I said, we're packaging the apps because our program officer at the NEH, you're going to show this in the world, aren't you? I'm being very uh, does not understand that we could build something for the mobile web that is not an app. So what we're packaging, there's a lovely software that used to be called um, PhoneGap, which is now called Cordova, is that you can design one little entryway homepage and then it will produce it for all the SDKs for all the for all the different platforms. And so we can with one with one little homepage that says, here's the URL, go to this site. We can put something in each of those stores. Uh, but the content in the site is so massive that you'd never be able to package it as an app. And for people who care about collections 
and care about the integrity of those collections. Uh, you can't do apps. You just can't do it. You cannot use your content in ways that is real and meaningful. Uh, so in addition to finding users where they are, and, and this site actually goes with users where they are out into the world, it's not, um, it's not bound by a particular collection. And that's one of the things that we're free to do as, uh, as the center because we don't have any holdings of our own. We get to cross those boundaries. The Smithsonian never would have done this site because it uses material from all of the open access collections in the general Washington area. And so that kind of uh, cross-institutional collaborative work is really hard to do if you're in one of those institutions. Nonetheless, I think it's important for us to think about how we can play nicely with others. Um, and the work that we do at the center has, for many years, tried to facilitate that work, um, that kind of collaboration. Some of you may have seen the Becerra History Archive. This is another sort of early Omeka site. And it's not so very interesting because of its Omeka-ness. What it's interesting uh, for is that because it was built as a site, um, a collection that was digital first, our partners from around the country could collaborate on it all together because Omeka is a web, you know, a web software so that they could log in from wherever they were, whether they were in San Jose or they were in San Antonio doing collecting visits, they could create material and gather material into the archive. So this site brought together folks from UTEP, from the Oral History Institute at UTEP, um, scholars from Brown, folks from the Smithsonian, and a bunch of the California State University schools. And they had local collecting days where uh, former Buceros and their families would come in and bring their material, and they'd do some oral histories, and we'd scan their documents and their photos and, and gather all of that material, put it, into the, put it into the collection, and then send people home with their stuff. They didn't actually have to give us their stuff. Um, and the only way that this worked in this time frame that we had and the scale that we had was for everybody to be able to use the web as the central gathering place. Um, that has spawned other work in other areas that are that's similar. The folks at the University of Lincoln at Nebraska are doing a series of local, what they call history harvests. And unlike the Becerra archive, which was targeted on a particular population with a particular question about their experience as migrant workers, the history harvests are just general local history. Bring us your stuff. Um, and they're just gathering and gathering and gathering. And it's, and it's a way for students to learn about the places where they, where they live and the stories that they can, that they can tell there. So some of, the, some of the playing nice with others is technical. Curate Escape is basically a layer on top of Omeka that allows you to do a local digital history project and to actually con construct tours um, in, in, in the landscape uh, using Omeka as the first layer and then the Curate Escape as the second layer. And it's all free, it's all open source, it does package an app. It will build a mobile-ready website, but they will also package an iPhone and an Android app for you. Um, and so this work was done by our friends at Cleveland State University because they had questions that they had about, about how their local community, their college students, but also their seniors and their civic groups could come together to curate the landscape of Cleveland. And curate escape projects are happening all over the country using this one. Use, Cleveland Historical uses collections from all over Cleveland, but primarily Case Western was the first, was the, the, was the seed collection for that. Um, but there's one in Spokane, and there's one in Baltimore, and there's one in Boston, they're all over the place. Um, and so they're growing on a regular basis. To make this work possible, it seems to me, we need standardized, easy to deal with rights statements. We can't do the work that we do with open source material without some sense of what we can find. And the great thing about the Creative Commons licensing is it's machine readable. If those tags are machine readable, it makes our lives a whole lot easier. I heard a ridiculous st 
statistic the other day that I'm not going to be able to bring to mind about the number of rights statements that are included in Europeana. It's astounding the different number of rights statements. Our friends at the DPLA are well over 200 different rights statements, even though they're trying to standardize that material. We have to do something about this. Um, we have to do something about this for a variety of, of issues. But for rights statements in particular, if we can please make some decisions and adopt some things. Um, that is part of my sort of other request for the world for, and this will not be a foreign request to this audience, but boy, do the people in the museum world fight it like there's no tomorrow. Uh, shared, structured metadata schemas, anyone? Anyone? Shared, structured metadata schemas. Uh, we need to have them. We need to use them everywhere. Um, one of the things about Omeka that has, I think, hopefully moved the world along is that Dublin Core is baked in. Dublin Core is baked in, and so whether people want to deal with it or not, none of it's required, but Dublin Core is baked in. And so what we're, we're trying to, with the presets, push some of our more reluctant colleagues in, in the museum world into a system where their data would be interoperable. Omeka is not going to be the solution for forever. There's no chance it's going to be. And so you've got to be able to get the stuff out. Um, and the only way that works is if we have those shared standard metadata schemas. So we've seen some uptake because of this. Because DPLA, or because um, Dublin Core is at the heart of the way that Europeana deals with its data, Europeana has used Omeka for its exhibits. This is true also of DPLA. Um, and that's just sort of in the baseline of, of what they do. Um, and so they're, built, they're also building their exhibits in Omeka and are looking for people to help build exhibit, exhibits with their, with their content. Um, all of this helps us get us to a spot where we can embrace um, experimentation and those kinds of things. Uh, the primary way that that happens with Omeka is that there's an API built in. Um, and so the kind of experimentation that I'm talking about embracing is not, I mean, sure, we want people to build stuff um, with the actual content. But the other thing that we want is we want people to build new tools that will use the content. Um, DPLA has taken this approach in a really productive way. They've got an entire um, page of apps that have been built using their open API. Um, and the whole philosophy behind it is that they want to encourage the independent development of apps and tools because they can't tell what people are going to want to do with their content. And they shouldn't have to. Um, and so just like the tribal communities that are interested in the stuff that's in the papers of the War Department, we can't predict that. And so we've got to make the material open so that people can use them. In some cases, what results is a sort of back to the future approach to uh, building for digital material. Um, the, the DPLA Stack Life app is, I, I'm almost positive it was the very first app that was built for DPLA. And it was to take the materials that are in DPLA and try to return um, the experience of browsing the stacks, putting things next to each other in the way that, the, that they would be. Um, but lots of them are not. Um, that kind of back to the future approach. Uh, Serendipomatic asks you to drop in a block of text. And it then pushes that block of text out through the search engines of a variety of open access feeds to return inspirational material to you. Things that you might not have thought of based on the text that you've given it. Um, our friends at Cooper Hewitt are doing, and a whole bunch of people are doing this at the moment, in a way that the Cooper Hewitt collections, we can think about them as individual pieces of material, but we can also think about what colors are they? Whoever thought that we were going to search by color through a museum collection? And that's exactly what this is. This is the CSS4 search collection. And so you hit a color, and you get the materials that match. 
Um, and so what I'm suggesting is that we've got to start to think about a wide range of experiments that can be facilitated by providing open access material and then providing programmatic access to that material. And Omeka is something that, that you can use to do both of those things. Um, so I would say, if we're going to meet users where they are, and we want to play nicely with others, and we want to embrace uh, and support experimentation, we can actually start to put our collections to work in new ways that might be unexpected. So tell me about your users and who you want to play with, and who you want to experiment with, what you want to see next. We're always looking for new projects, new things to build. Do you have collections? I think that one of the things that um, struck me about the presentation was like the history harvest and the idea of doing that like at a family reunion or Absolutely. a public library branch. You know? Yep. Yep, that's exactly that's exactly I was there are so many different ways to do that kind of um, work on a smaller scale. Um, that let me see if I can find a browser window. There we go. Um, this is going to be hard. So with Omeka.net, you really, oh, I forgot. I'm not on the internet. Um, what I was going to show you is that, that anybody of any size and resource can conduct one of those. Um, you know, if you just go sign up for an Omeka.net account, you can start to build your family history site um, with no trouble at all. Um, and if it gets big enough, you know, Maybe you need a little bit more storage. Um, all of my students are building their, their culminating projects for the class I'm teaching this semester at Omeka.net. Um, and they have, there's enough capacity and access there for them, for them to do that. But it doesn't have to be hard for us to gather and preserve this material. And since there's an API built in, you can push it out to some other larger aggregator or collector. Just Um, so all of these things work together, and so it is possible to to map uh, to mass create items with the CSV importer. Um, that includes geolocation. Yeah. Yep. Um, so if you include the geolocation coordinates for it, it yeah, it'll it'll work just fine. Um, CSV works really nicely with what should not be called the Dropbox plugin because it doesn't have anything to do with Dropbox, the service. But really, all it is is is, is bulk file upload. And so if it knows, if your, your CSV has the file names, it'll work.